Imagine cracking the marketing code to the point where your business becomes a household name. Well, that's exactly what Ben Goodfellow, the founder of the now iconic tradie underwear brand, has done. And in this revealing chat, he shares exactly how he's done it. It's episode 455 of the award-winning Small Business Big Marketing Show, thanks to American Express. Well, I say, welcome to a small business marketing show, where successful small business owners share their souls to take your marketing straight to the lead. Now, here's your host, Mr. Tim Reed. And welcome back to your weekly dose of marketing lunacy. I'm your host, Timbo Reed. You, infinitely more importantly, you're a motivated business owner and you're ready to crank out some great marketing to build that beautiful business of yours into the empire it absolutely deserves to be. Today's 455th episode is made possible thanks to American Express, whose business card programs can help optimize your cash flow, grow your business, as well as an outstanding choice of rewards do they have. Check them out, Google Amex Business to find out more. Big show today. Always a big show. We catch up with Ben Goodfellow, the creator of the Trady Underwear brand, that in like next to no time, a matter of years, has become a household name in Australia. Steve Sims is back to share another simple way you can wow those precious, precious clients of yours. And I'll reveal a couple of great guests we've got coming up in coming weeks. As per usual, team, there is marketing G-O-L-D dripping from the ceiling over here at Small Business Big Marketing's HQ. So let's get stuck right in. Oh, wow. 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 Did someone say something? You know what that means. It's time for another business building tip to wow those precious, precious clients of yours. Thanks to our great mates at American Express, whose business card programs also make the smart business owner go wow. As usual, all the way from the City of Angels, we're joined by Steve Sims, speaker and best-selling author, he tells me, of Blue Fishing, the Art of Making Things Happen. Simsy, how can we make our beautiful clients go wow this week? Well, it's funny you should ask that, my buddy. Um, I, I've always been a, a real admirer of taking a fan uh, from a fan to a fanatic. Oh. And there's a big difference, but there's some steps to do it. You see, fans are people that can like cheer and ch- chant and say good things about you. Fanatics are those that go out and do it for you to others and turn those fans into fanatic. So concentrate on them. And give them a story that you can that they can pass on to other people. Tell them what it is you do in simple manners. And even, here's a good tip, mm. poll your clients and go, hey, if you were to meet someone in the street who said, what is it that X does? What would you tell them? And get them to tell you what you do so they can tell more people what it is and get them to be fanatics for your brand. That's a nice one. In fact, you know, putting that language into those fanatics or those fans' mouths so that they can very clearly talk about your business is quite a smart thing to do. Not easy because it's kind of you've really got to kind of craft your words. Would you get a copywriter involved in that or how would you go about it? Do you know, I've done that before. I've got copywriters in it before and I've got people to write really elegant quotes on what it is I've done and those have been the least successful. <laughs> yeah. I've actually gone out to people in my social pages. I've emailed my clients. I've called my clients and I've actually said to them, in as least words as possible, what it is it would you say that I did that makes things so wonderful? That's the best verbiage in the planet because it comes from real people. Yeah, I like that. So the idea, I mean, having a fan is not a bad thing, but having a fanatic is something together all completely different, right? Well, fanatics actually create communities, create a mm. culture, and you don't want a fan base anymore. You don't want a client base anymore. You want a culture. You want a you want a cult that is there chanting that what you stand for 
is everything. Now, mate, I know you come from Los Angeles, and that's where that's because maybe it's the city of cults. <laughs> but can we use the word tribe and not cult going forward, please? <laughs> I'll try. Yeah, you'll try. Thank you very much, Dad. Joke there. Hey, uh, Simsy, great one. Take a fan and turn them into a fanatic. That's another killer way to make those precious clients go wow. Thanks to American Express. To find out how Amex can add a little wow to your business, Google Amex Business after the show. Thanks, Steve. See ya. Righto, let's meet today's guest, Ben Goodfellow, who I've admired from afar for the way he's so very quickly made the tradie underwear brand a household name in Australia. Now, Ben loves brands. In fact, from a very early age, like we're talking, you know, 10, when other kids were swapping footy cards, Ben would sit at the kitchen table with his old man and talk branding. That's an advanced conversation for a 10-year-old. <laughs> hey, Dad, I want to have a chat about brands. You got 10 minutes? Well, it's paid off, as he's now responsible for the iconic tradie underwear brand that next year, how's this? going to be turning over in excess of 100 mil selling undies make it 100 mil they must be good undies so grab a pen and paper as ben reveals exactly how he's gone about creating a household name from scratch i started off by asking him how and why he decided to launch an underwear brand in australia Oh, look, growing up, I um, I was absolutely obsessed with branding. Uh, there's no question that I love the idea of having a brand, and I also always hoped that I would have a brand that would um, be associated to me. That that's what I did, um, and so that's sort of how it started. Also, part of the this is a family business, so certainly uh, sitting around the dinner table, I um, often talked about brands. Um, as my father actually ran Bonds for 20 years. So it was in the DNA from an early age to try and start a great brand. What does a brand discussion sound like around the family kitchen table? Yeah, it was an interesting childhood. Um, we, we talked about branding nonstop and, and underwear nonstop. So uh, I think I appeared in a, a catalogue as a young kid uh, selling pyjamas for the old man at some stage. So, um, yeah, they were interesting conversations, <laughs> but it meant that uh, the seed was planted early on. And a bit of competition was um, probably planted in me as well to try and do better than Bonds, given that was my dad's. I'm going to throw a brand out to you, which I hope creates some emotion in you because it certainly does with me. Sure. Golden Breed. Golden Breed. Gosh, you might be showing your age there. Yeah, yeah. No, thanks, Ben. Wow. <laughs> How old are you? I'm 36. Oh, yeah, mate. I'm, so, I'm, I'm 51, so I'm absolutely showing okay. my age. But you, you know okay. the brand I'm talking about, don't you? Absolutely. They've got a great store in uh, in Flinders and uh, Nick Vandermeer is the guy that owns that, I believe. And it's a very small industry. So everybody knows everyone. Yeah. Uh, particularly on the smaller side of the scale, we try and support each other where we can. And, and he's got a great brand that I think really fills a niche in Australia. Well, it does, it does. And, you know, one of the things I love, and let's just have that branding discussion. We'll come back to how tradie and why you started this underwear brand. But um, that whole branding thing, you know, so many small business owners do ignore it at their peril. And I can already feel my, my favorite definition of a brand is it's an emotional attachment. And I can already feel for you, that's exactly what you try to do with whatever you create. Would that be fair? A hundred percent. So oh, I see it as a tribal sort of attachment. I think that what we've got to do is create a, a great brand that people feel passionate about. They actually almost want to go to the pub and, and preach about our, our brand and tell other people how good it is from all sorts of angles, like from the marketing to the to the quality and all sorts of things and the comfort. But it becomes tribal and they, they really associate themselves to it. And, and if you can create that and it's easier said than done, then you've really got a wonderful brand that you can build up for many years to come and it means that you're not a fad for two or three years you can be a, a great brand for a hundred years yeah love it but it's you've really got to connect okay back to uh how, how tradie came about okay um how did it come about i uh as i said i was obsessed with t starting a brand and i particularly uh love the underwear space and so i uh i heard that the top four sellers at target um top four out of five actually were the chesty bond singlet and so I decided, well, shit, I'm going to take on the Chesty Bond singlet. And um, everybody laughed at me, particularly my old man, because um, no one can take on an iconic product like the Chesty Bond singlet. But if they were getting, if they were top four out of the five at Target, then I should have a crack. So for the next two months, I didn't sleep. I was a bit of an insomniac in those days. So I um, rolled around in bed over and over again, trying to think of a name. And eventually I came to the point where I thought, well, who wears the singlet? It's, uh, it's the tradies. 
So I then went about getting a logo developed and, um, and then I went and got some product sampled, starting with the singlet. And, uh, and away we went from there, showcasing it to a couple of retailers and sort of selling them the dream of uh, we're going to build an iconic Australian brand. So, so just on that, um, from memory, tra- uh, the, the tradies singlet of choice up until your, you came along, wasn't, didn't Hard Yakka just own that space? No, it was Bonds. The Chesty Bonds singlet is one of the most iconic Australian things there is, and uh, it, it, they, they controlled the entire market. And, and Yakka did not have a, a blue singlet? Was that a Bond singlet? No, I'm thinking that of. was a Bond singlet. Yep. Wow, that's the power of brand, huh? Exactly. And so they, it really was an amazing product that, um, that did incredibly well for them, and no one had ever had the courage, I think, to take them on, and, and no one thought you really could. And it was pretty stupid to take it on, to be fair, um, but it, it paid off in the end. And, and we had a go. We managed to convince one of the retailers to, to put it in. How? How do you manage to convince? These guys are tough. They're Dobermans. They don't give... They, they just want blood. How do you go and convince? Oh, no. These are my partners. They're the most beautiful people on the planet. <laughs> they, they are tough. There's no question about that. And uh, when you've got a 26-year-old bloke rolling in and telling them that they really need to take on a tradie branded singlet that they've never heard of to take on the most iconic brand in Australia, the most loved brand in Australia. Yeah, it probably wasn't the easiest sell I've ever had to do in my life. Well, so what was the sell? What was the pitch? To be completely fair, I, I think that I, I got in front of a buyer that um, that I still deal with to this day who, who saw it and immediately had an idea in her head as well. It sort of resonated with her and she just saw the potential. And so she jumped on and said, I'm not just doing a singlet, I'm going to do underwear as well. And she had the foresight and, you know, that's luck. All these things, a lot of people that start great brands and all these things, you need a little bit of luck. And that meeting, um, it was staged by me in terms of I, sh- I was showing her some other things, but I made sure that the tradie singlet was at the bottom of a bag so I could finish the meeting with that. Uh, I put it in front of her and, and, and she she took the bait and then, uh, and then ran with it. And certainly we went from a singlet to underwear very quickly uh, and she took a chance on us. And, uh, yeah, I was very fortunate, and the relationship is still very strong to this day. So there is the launch of the Tradies brand. Your target buyer, you get the deal. How did that feel? Now, it wasn't Target. It was actually Big W. So I got my intel from Target, and then I managed to sell it into Big W. I love it. <laughs> yeah, correct. Hello to the Target buyers out there who are now probably buying from you, are they? They are not. They, uh, they have shunned Tradie, but that's fine. We've got some wonderful partners that have been on board from day one, and Big W is certainly a big part of our business. Why would Target target be shunning do they are they do they have exclusive exclusivity around bonds or you've just uh, really <laughs> pissed them off no not at all no we we deal with target with some some house brand items and, and private label it's just the target uh was taken over by kmart uh management and kmart management had a very focused approach to no brands uh and certainly going as cheap as possible and um and they didn't really want brands like us that sort of offer a value equation yeah uh so we really didn't we we didn't work with Target on this one. Plus, I think we've got such great relationships with other retailers like your Big W's, your Woolworths, um, and a lot of independents like Boating, Camping, Fishing, and all the rest of them. That um, while Target's going through all their change and, and really trying to strip brands out, we're better to sell to the the people that want us. Yes, fair enough. Tell me, Ben, that moment when you got the deal with Big W. Yep. How'd you feel? It's pretty special. There's no question. I was 26 years old and I uh, managed to get. Uh, a brand into a, a retailer with 200 stores. Uh, I remember it like it was yesterday. I was absolutely stoked because I, I believe that that was going to be a tipping point for what we were doing. It just gave us such a great opportunity. So yeah, it was it was remarkable and um, I certainly went home extremely excited and then we went about working on, on the product and making sure it was right. But yeah, I, I knew at that point we, we had a chance to really take on, on the big boys. Had you create, I've heard this story before where you get the big contract through and then create a problem that you're not sure that you can fulfill. Did you know you could fulfill that order? Yeah, I knew I could fulfill it. Okay. Um, I, look, I had the expertise in the underwear space, so I knew we could do it. We didn't have that issue. The delivery was extremely tight, so we had to make everything happen because it was a once in a lifetime opportunity. We had to turn around in, in, in ridiculous time, so there was definitely a trip to China to try and make that happen, yes. which we did, and uh, and then we, we got it in there, and once it got in there, it actually sold incredibly well, which then 
allowed us to grow from there. I think if it had gone in and hadn't sold well, well that would have been all over. Mm-hmm. But the fact that it sold itself once it was in there, the buyer was 100% correct that it was a great idea. What was it that made it sell itself? I mean, that you know, the, the best marketing is a great product, okay? You would have been assured yourself that it was a great product. The buyer had seen it. They'd liked it. They thought it was a great product. Underwear... From memory, I don't think you're allowed to try it on in store, are you? You can't take it out of the packaging. You definitely can't. So there's a number of factors. You've got to have a brand that people immediately resonate to. So our brand, Trady, people believed it had been around for a long time. Yeah. Um, Also, it's tribal in terms of if you're Trady or blue collar or a low-level white collar, it turns out that you really resonate with that. You know, you want to be part of that group. And so uh, people really bought into that. The price point was right. It was um, sitting at a, a really nice price where it was a lot cheaper than the other uh, big national brand, but it was also a price point above the house brand or a private label. And it looked great on the shelf, but most of all, people resonated with it. The name immediately resonated with people more than I expected. Um, And so it sold incredibly well to start with. It's an interesting name. Um, I, a long, long time ago, worked in advertising and uh, my colleague in the next office was running the Mazda account. And it was the time when the Mazda RX-7 came out. And they did a TV ad for it. And the TV ad was a middle-aged bloke in what looked like a supermarket, but it was a gigantic toy store. And at the end of the aisle, he looks down the aisle, and there's this beautiful red RX-7 sitting there. And he goes and looks at it and loves it. And the tagline was Mazda RX-7, something like Big Boy's Toys, right? It failed dismally because... No middle-aged man wanted it highlighted the fact that they were after a big boy's toy, you know? Yes, yep. they were, but they didn't want the world to know about it. I, it feels like tradey should have fallen into that problem as well, where it's like, yeah, I know, it's it's a generic, it's tradey. I'm a tradey, so I wear tradies. Like, what, are we going to make office pants, underpants for office workers saying... I don't know, office workers? Yeah, boy, Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Is, are you surprised it worked? Uh, no. I, I, look, I truly believed in it. I, you know, I became pretty obsessed with my brand. But oh, look, you never know. I think what it was as well that you know, I had this theory early on was that tradies were really respected at the time. They were well paid. Uh, they were outdoors. If you're a trader, you still you surf quite often. You might... I don't have the theory of the, the big, the larger tradie with the plumber's crack out the back. I was I was of the opinion that no, traders are young guys with a flash you surfing... Yes outdoorsy, playing sport, all the rest of it, so that there is a, and 60 to 70% of men's underwear is bought by female. And so females, I think, related to tradies, they're like, good on them, they're outdoorsy and active. Uh, and then guys were proud to be tradies or blue collar-esque. And so I think that we immediately captured that market. I think they resonated with the brand very quickly. This is before we went out and presented it. However, I also did a number of things on the packaging itself like I preached to my team that every um, every product, every garment is a billboard because we couldn't afford billboards at the time. So we made sure that there was a hell of a lot of stickers and a hell of a lot of uh, swing tickets so that we could really scream out the features and benefits of why you should buy us, you know. And if I've got 10 pegs in a big W store and each one of those 10 pegs is a billboard, well, that's pretty good. I like that. Every product is a billboard. Make it work hard. It's a touch point. It's an opportunity for you to convert someone. Correct. Now, someone that's never seen us before, I'm going to make them think they have seen us before, and um, and they're going to very clearly know what we're about by looking at my packaging, and that's from a few different things. There'll be a saddle on top of the product, there'll be a swing ticket, and there'll be a sticker, and it really helps them to make their decision quickly. So yeah, every product's a billboard. We swear yeah. by that. Now, let's just rewind back a bit, because you're telling me your old man was at Bonds yes. for 20 years. You're yes. also telling me Bonds are the your greatest, your nemesis, the competitor that you want to beat to a pole. That's right. What's yes. going on here? Are you and your old man at each other? Do you get each other in headlocks when you get home and rub each other's ears together really quickly? And well, It's an interesting relationship. I think there's a <laughs> dad's a very excited by it. I think he's very proud that, uh, that we've had such amazing growth and then created such an amazing brand that people resonate with. I think there's a little tear in his eyes, Will, that his little baby's losing market share to us. Uh, I think he's also very sad that his little baby Bonds got sold to the Americans uh, in Haynes, so we lost yes. an Australian iconic brand. So I think he then goes, all right, bugger it, we've got to be the brand, the actual, now we are the Australian iconic brand. So so your old man came across to trading. Dad was there for 20 years, and then he got out uh, probably 15 years ago now, and then uh, once his non-compete was up after probably three or five years, 
Um, he then set up a number of small businesses in the sock space, the hosiery space, and the underwear space. I, um, I worked at Ernst & Young. Uh, I was a finance marketing graduate, and I worked at Ernst & Young for four years. And then uh, he said, can you come on board and run the, the underwear business, which was failing at the time uh, in many respects because all it did was private label, yep. and we had no brand. So uh, he sent me the very easy task of turning it around and creating a brand from nothing. So I was like, thanks, Dad. That sounds like a great idea. <laughs> that uh, is awesome. So, wow. I mean, the, the power of the collective minds of your old man with 20 years experience with the biggest underwear brand for men in Australia or for, and women, and then you coming in with this crazy yeah. passion for wanting to Correct. create an iconic Australian brand. Mate, this had no choice but to succeed. Well, maybe. I mean, if it failed, it would have been uh, probably very funny for Dad. Uh, it would have been a great marketing case yeah. study either way. Absolutely. Look, it's an interesting one. It shows you that the, the rag trade is in your blood, and Dad certainly passed that on to me. And then uh, I've been fortunate that one of my ideas paid off. And I think you've got to have 20 ideas, maybe 100 ideas, for the one good one to come along. And then when you find that one good one, you really, really go for it. And that's certainly what we've done here, probably above and beyond. I mean, a good example is that... Um, we were doing some private label business, which was declining at a rapid rate because uh, all the retailers were going to China direct and cutting out middlemen like us. Yeah. So I very I sort of calculated, well, how much money do we actually make out of this private label? And and I said, well, that dollar, every bit of profit there is really dead money. Mm -hmm. That's gone. So why don't we put that money into marketing, something that's our future? And that's sort of why we've been able to be so much more aggressive in the early days than what really the turnover, the brand um, warranted. Hey, I'm guessing your business has many, many needs. Maybe you need extended cash flow to bring to life that genius marketing idea that you've been sitting on for way too long. Or maybe you'd love a rewards points program that had you flying at the pointy end of the plane on the trip of a lifetime. Maybe you're just like a business tool that made running that beautiful business of yours just that little bit easier. Well, here's what I'd do. After the show, check out American Express's range of business cards designed specifically to help small businesses like yours. Simply Google Amex Business to find out more. Now, back to the interview. We're talking to Ben Goodfellow, who is the mastermind, along with his old man, behind the Tradie brand. And we are discovering slowly but very, very surely how on earth it has become such a household name so quickly. So, Ben, things take off. The undies are selling beautifully. Uh, clearly, the first point of it becoming a household name is that you're, you're making the packaging work really, really hard. You've got a great product. What was Absolutely. the next step in, in the tradie brand once you got the underwear under control? So then there was expansion very quickly in terms of once you've got a few styles at work, you've very quickly got to develop multiple extra styles. So from sports styles to long leg trunks to different fly front trunks. You know, there's a lot of different styles within the underwear space and we're purely talking men's at this stage. So you get very busy uh, with that. So you're a quick expansion. Once you prove yourself that you're going to sell, um, the retailers are very excited then to take on the big boys and so they want to support you. So we, we, we got busy developing uh, and then I very quickly did some numbers on that and said, well, we've got to start marketing. Let's not worry. Let's not uh, not think it, think back in five years' time and wish we'd gone harder. So we certainly had a crack. And so I then got into, immediately got into some advertising and I um, the I looked at a few different options of radio and bus backs and I, um, I went down the bus back path and I made sure that I parked about 20 to 40 buses outside Big W's head office for about three months to make sure that they knew I was spending every dollar I had on marketing while we were expanding the range. And that was um, that was quite fun at the time, and it certainly helped. Uh, just to understand that idea, because I love that, I, I did a similar thing when I was working on the Yellow Pages business many, many, many years ago, where we'd make sure that surrounding Yellow Pages headquarters, there were lots and lots of Yellow Pages ads to remind, the, the, actually, the staff of how good the brand was way back then. Um, yep. you, you, you put buses outside Big W's headquarters? Is that what you yes. said you did? So basically, I just picked buses that were on the... Um, on the, the route that went past the, the, the Big W and Woolworths head office. And we certainly had buses in other areas, but I, I certainly went heavier on the ones around Big W because at that point we were realizing this, the product was selling really well itself and I didn't have a marketing budget that would allow me to spread it across Australia 
even though we had a, a national footprint all of a sudden through the Big W network. So um, basically, we decided that we would, well, I decided that we would market really heavily to the targeted person, and those people were the buyers. So um, that worked really well because it gave them confidence that I was going to spend up big on marketing every chance I got. And then we developed new products which worked as well. And so it just from there, it just incrementally grew um, year on year. What was the advertising? And we've spoken about this on the show previously. Adver- advertising is a bottomless pit. Uh, sure. It's for most small business owners a scary proposition for a number of reasons. A, it's expensive. Yep. B, the amount of variable variables you've got to get right, whether you're talking about bus backs or ads in papers or radio, TV, you know, you've got to, if it, even for like, say, a, a newspaper ad, you've got to figure out which newspaper, what part of the newspaper, right hand, left, left hand side, um, color, mono, what's the headline, what's the creative, uh, what's the frequency. I mean, there are just so many variables. For you, I guess your old man had a lot of experience in that in that advertising area, or he did he? Came, look, he came up with some iconic ads himself. He, he did the Ants Pants ad. Ah, oh. remember that one, Sikkim Rex? Awesome. Um, and he did the one day you're going to get caught with your pants oh. down ad with, for a whole proof. So he um, he has a list of good ads that we need to catch up on. Um, so he certainly was helpful. Um, there's no question that having a mentor that as close to you to me as that is, is great. Everyone in a business, when you're a bit entrepreneurial, needs a good mentor. Um, just happens that mine's my dad. Yeah. Um, but I certainly, it was very nerve wracking at that stage because spending the sort of, you know, that money that I spent in year one was a huge spend for us. We'd never done any marketing before. And here I was 26 years old going, well, we're doing it, no questions asked. So I remember meeting with radio stations and they wanted to take the whole lump sum that I had in one week. Yeah. And that's all I could get in, I think it was only in Melbourne and Sydney, if that. And then um, then I realized that, you know what, that's not going to affect the sales. What I really need to do is just try and encourage the buying team to keep backing us because it's selling at the moment. So yeah. I think you've got to be really careful with your initial spend. What is the greatest value you're going to get out of it? For me, it was actually to advertise to the buyers um, and make sure that the buyers' bosses knew about us and that's why they were willing to support us because we were going to get the growth incrementally anyway. Um, I think if I'd gone down the radio path and gone straight to consumer more so, uh, it really wouldn't have helped us as much as what I did. But that's, look, there's no question that year one, that was one of the most nerve-wracking things I've had to do. What did you spend? 100 grand, which was a lot for us at that stage. Ooh. How was that sleepless night once you once you signed that contract? Well, my uh, my... Girlfriend at the time remembers me waking up uh, in the middle of the night with a cold sweat, uh, still half asleep, sitting at the end of the bed, just saying seven pack undies, seven pack undies, second pack, seven pack undies, over and over again in my sleep. So obviously I was talking in my sleep about undies nonstop. So the stress yes. levels were pretty high. So yeah, look, the pressure was on at that stage, but it was exciting as well because if it worked, we knew that it was going to be a pretty, um, pretty big uplift. What was the creative and what was the outcome? So the creative, uh, what we did was we put it on bus backs and um, I worked with a, an agency that I still work with to this day who have become uh, very, very close called The Incubator and they uh, came up with the, the slogan, The Ultimate Toolbox. <laughs> and so what we did was we, we had no models, couldn't afford a model, we needed to do as cheap as possible. We just did a very close up photo of the undies um, and then uh, The Ultimate Toolbox, nice and big and then where you could buy it, tagged in the bottom and they floated around, um, around Sydney in particular. Mm-hmm. And uh, it certainly got a few responses, a few letters from people finding oh, it yes. offensive. But oh, the PC crowd would have been up in arms. Absolutely, uh, Alan and Dad and I, um, we pin them on the wall whenever we get something like that because it means people are noticing our advertising. Yeah, exactly. Oh, well, just on, just on that, uh, great, well done for doing that. Um, sometimes the small business owner can kind of freak out and and lose confidence and quickly pull it. Oh, you know, we're getting you know because the minority sometimes gets heard. You took the other view. Absolutely. And, and look, the whole way through, if you spoke to my uh, media agency, I um, I roll the dice every chance I get. You know, I really, really want to build this into a great brand. And so we we genuinely go above and beyond what the brand warrants at this stage, just knowing we're going to get there. We are an aggressive marketing business, but that's because my love in life is marketing. Just explain to me, you you roll the dice every chance you get. So you take a ri- you err on the on the side of risk. Well, I think when in terms of the spend compared to turnover, um, we certainly do. I think we take chances when opportunities come up where there might be a last minute TV program that desperately needs a major sponsor, and I've already committed what I think is our true budget. I will uh, go for a long hard run and uh, and think about whether or not we want to jump on it, and then generally I have. 
and then fortunately the growth has come as well. So they're calculated, but we certainly aren't afraid to, to take a few chances here and there. And it's certainly paid off at this point in time, which is why we are now more of a household brand. What's the biggest risk you've taken that failed? Oh, that's a good one. I think it was actually last year where I um, I sponsored the the footy show. Um, they had a last minute pull out of um, of a major sponsor, mm-hmm. and uh, they needed an answer within a day. And they did a really good rate for me, but they needed they needed a sponsor to come on board. And we sponsored it nationally, which was a huge deal for us. And in many ways, it was great because it put our name amongst some fantastic ones. However, they sadly mistreated the New South Wales NRL Thursday night footy show, moved it around from night to night, moved it out to later, changed the format without us knowing, and um, and the ratings were absolutely bombed. So it was a risk that really fell apart. Um, however, it still worked out because it's a long-term relationship there, so Channel 9 will do the right thing and catch it up. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was certainly a big spend for us on top of what I'd already committed to the, was the Bachelor sponsorship and a few others. Now, there was still positive that came out of it because Eddie McGuire did an amazing job in Melbourne of pumping up it on the Victorian show. It was just the Sydney show that was very disappointing. What's your view on mass media, Ben? Uh, it's, yeah. Media's become so fragmented these days. I'm sure, am I, am I sure? If you rolled up your sleeves and really went down the path of chasing the different uh, different demographics that you appeal to, you might save some money. You went down, you know, Facebook ads here and a bit of Instagram advertising and all this and, you know, some outdoor billboards and whatever. Yep. But yep. you've just chosen this really mass broadcast approach. Yeah, well, there's a few reasons for that. I think that, you know, social definitely has its place. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm selling through mainstream channels at this point in time. Um, so while we're growing through them, I think that mainstream TV still has a wonderful effect for us. And I think it's proven by, at the moment, it's working incredibly well. Um, this does get brought up a lot with me going, you know, what as a young Australian brand like this, why aren't you doing more online? Mm. We still do some, but we are putting the core into TV because I, I do love touching on the true mainstream consumer. But the, the mix will change over time and will evolve um, and I'm keeping my eye on it. But at this stage, given my assets are very much in TV because I film each year, I'm filming you know five to six TV ads. Wow. That's where I believe that I want to put my money into TV. Now, that's just because I've come up, I think we've come up with some really great, fun, simple ads that work. So if I didn't have those amazing simple ads uh, with the honey badger and, mm. and the girls that we've brought on, uh, then I might not be as heavy in TV. Okay, so um, just to wrap up that conversation, though, um, I guess your TV buying, unlike years gone by, you may well not remember where you could literally buy a schedule across the entire day and night, and you got yep. a whole, you, you got a massive amount of the population. I, I'm guessing you need to be very selective. You're just buying The Bachelor. You're just buying Love at First Sight. You're just buying, you know, I don't know, just those key shows because there's a lot of people not watching TV these days. Correct. So I, what I did was I broke. I think I broke the rules a bit in terms of the media team would often come to me with a spot buy across all different things, and I said no. I've only got a limited budget, guys. It's a bit like my buses. I want to be really targeted, and so if a million people watch The Bachelor, I want the entire million people that watch her, watch that show to know us by the end of the program. Mm-hmm. Now, if I scattered her across all sorts of shows, if you're watching a different program, Home and Away, you might see us twice. You're never going to remember us. But if I, if I show my ad three times in a Bachelor program for an entire 12 weeks or whatever it goes for, those million people will certainly know my ad. Yeah. So what I'd do is break it down by, by markets like that rather than doing spot buys. I'm going to race ahead. You did. You mentioned the Honey Badger earlier. This is an international <laughs> audience. Uh, the Honey Badger is a fellow, uh, Nick Cummins, who is an Aussie rug, Australian rugby league, le- a rugby union legend. I'm an AFL guy, so I don't even know Nick at all. But he's been on. He was also on The Bachelor, so he's a, he's a bit of a, a known identity in Australia. Ha- yep. How did that celebrity endorsement come about? Oh, it's a pretty good story, actually. I um, It was year three, and so I'd done the buses, uh, buses year one. Year two, I did a radio campaign, and I look back at those radio ads and think they were, they were pretty humorous. Uh, and then the next year, I was like, th- year three, we've got to keep stepping up as hard as we can, so I need an ambassador. So I started to look around. Um, obviously, you stay away from tennis players because Australians just don't relate to them. My number one rule was I was looking for a guy that I wanted to have a beer with, and so did the rest of Australia, the beer test. Um, I came across a few different people, but there was one person that caught my eye. It was 
the Honey Badger did an interview after a game where he, he just finished a game in New Zealand and the interview's on YouTube. And I saw it on YouTube when I was looking at a few different things and it was one of the funniest interviews I've ever, ever seen because <laughs> he basically just spoke in what I call badgerisms. And uh, the commentators lost the plot. They thought it was the funniest thing they'd ever seen. So I saw that and I was like, that's my man. He had a very unique look as well because he had the long hair and the headband. And I said, this guy's as Aussie as you get. My brand <laughs> needs to be as Aussie as you can get. Um, so I went on Instagram and I found his Instagram site and I personally messaged him and said, hey, mate, I've got this underwear brand called Trady. Uh, would you be interested in coming on board? He wrote back to me and said, yep, sounds good, mate. About two or three weeks later, we had a long-term deal together and now we've been running together for probably, I don't know, we're probably up to five years now, six years, and with a, a number of years still to go. Wow. Yeah. How, how, how beautifully simple. Good on you for seeing that interview and identifying it very clearly that there is a guy that you want your brand to be like and he clearly had some very, it resonated deeply with your brand and you just reach out to him on Insta. Yeah, look, it's, a, it, it's looking back, it's a bit ridiculous, to be honest with you. Um, I signed the contract with him myself. I didn't even do it through um, a legal team. Oh, I love it. And um, and then I went to my marketing agency and I said, oh, guys, we need to do an ad for trading. We've got to do it on the tiniest budget you can possibly do. Uh, and I've already signed an ambassador. And they looked at me like I was absolutely mad. And now we're from Victoria, so that no one had ever heard of the Honey Badger, no. given we're an AFL town. And they genuinely looked like I was mad. Uh my dad thought I'd completely lost the plot. And then um, I said, all right, guys, write it out. I want it really simple, white screen, just have him talk in badgerisms. <laughs> so they went away and came up with some other ideas that weren't quite like that. I said, no, 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 oh, guys, I want white screen, simple as. I want three clear messages. I want good looking, quality and comfort. And I want him to say it in the most random Aussie <laughs> ways possible. White screen, he's got a twinkle in his eye. He'll make love to the camera, whatever you want. Yeah. And uh, away we go. They looked at me again like I was completely mad and I started to get a bit nervous. But um, we turned up on the day and he, he was amazing. He, he took some of the scripts that we'd written with some of his own lines um, and then he, he sort of freestyled a lot. So about I'd say about 25% is written and about 75% is him coming up with random things on the day. Brilliant. And I think that's why people resonated with the ad because it is very organic. You know, that agency thing, I'm wondering, uh, were they being precious and fe and fearing that their, their role as the copywriter and concept developer had been taken from them because here you are coming to them with the talent, coming to you with you with to them with the idea and essentially the talents uh, writing the ads they had no role was that it or was this they are an amazing group the incubator because yeah most people most agencies would have kicked me out at that point yes um they basically took an idea and, and I, look i didn't i couldn't pull it together 100 percent. i said this is my idea i see the twinkle in this bloke's eye i'm sure of it just make it happen and, and they made it happen and and they wrote the lines and and the reason we've had great ads from then on is because they've been able to really dive into what the concept is and, and make some great ads and they certainly still get steered a lot by me, but they don't get precious at all because we really do it together because they understand that marketing is my obsession. Yeah, fair enough. Interesting um, choice with the Honey Badger because he is very New South Wales centric. Uh, yeah. In Victoria, we have no idea who he is until he appears as the Bachelor on Correct. the Bachelor. Um, that you must have, you didn't know that was going to happen. Uh, no, I didn't. That was a bit of a surprise. What a bonus! Yeah, so we got some front page newspaper coverage for a long time leading into it, which was amazing. We look, we knew something was going on because we had to push back, push back our advertising shoot for about two or three months. But yeah, that was a huge surprise. I knew he was going to do something TV related at some stage because I think through our ads, he, we were on we were on TV so consistently that people were really falling in love with the Honey Badger. Mm -hmm. And so I knew that something would happen at some point. We've sort of been good for each other where he's built me up and I've built him up. And yeah, then he went on The Bachelor and then uh, it became a very interesting series. Because your decision to take him on initially really, I mean, in New South Wales, they're going to go, well, uh, that's the that's Nick Cummins representing um, tradie underwear. But everywhere else, and Queensland, but everywhere else, we just saw him. I mean, we just saw him as a funny guy, right? Correct. Yeah, and that was the greatest risk, is that I yeah. knew we had to create, he had to have enough personality and enough interest in him to warrant the ads that a Victorian or a South Australian would look at him and go, that was hilarious. And that really came down to the way he spoke and his badgerisms and the way he explained one of the key features of my product. Hey, I've just stepped out of the studio to play you one of the original 
TV ads Ben created to launch his underwear range starring rugby player Nick the Honey Badger Cummins. Check this out. Holy tomorrow, fellas. How good are these tradies? They're a snazzy-looking tackle box to house your rod and reel. Tradie underwear keeps you set up intact. Movement? No. Secure? Yes. Flasher than a rat with a gold tooth, and they're easy on the twig and berries. Fair dinkum, you have to be blind as a welder's dog if you can't see that other grunters look like the south end of a northbound wombat. These aren't your bog standard at all, they're the duck's nuts, ridgy didge, fair dinkum, get them on you. I just like them. Trady underwear, the ultimate toolbox. Cobra, what? <laughs> I love it. Great script, very funny, uh, very funny ad. Um, I'll put a link in the show notes to it over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com forward slash 455. Okay, let's head back into the studio. Uh, you, you continued the ambassador kind of uh, marketing strategy, Ben. We, you got Danielle Scott, who is um, our, one of our great freestyle aerial skiers, and you've got yep. Kelly Cartwright, who cancer survivor, yes. Paralympic gold medalist, and mum uh, amputee. Yep. Um, have did you did you hope that having Danielle and Kelly would work as well? as Nick did or did you have different expectations? I had different expectations because I think Nick uh, had a certain personality type um, and women's was interesting that women's was never part of my idea. It was something that got thrown to me and I thought it was a real risk to go into women's and I almost refused to do it because I knew the markdown support that I would need to give if it didn't work was going to be horrific. Um, uh, Big W forced me to do it in the end uh, and thank God they did because we now sell more women's underwear than we do men's. No. So what we were looking for in terms of a female ambassador is I decided, okay, well, what's the – men's is obviously larrikin, sporty, fun. What's women's going to be? We still need the fun, but we need it to be quite empowering. Like Trady is not a, a shrinking violet type of name or brand. So I think that athletes are the way to go, but they don't need to be the biggest name athletes. And so I like the idea of supporting someone like Danielle, who does have some sponsorships, but she's certainly not in a glamorous sport that's got – you know, Rolex and all the rest and uh, knocking on her door. So I really like the idea of supporting someone like her. I think her figure is, is perfect for our brand because she's sporting athletic. Mm. She's not just a skinny model. We did, you know, trade is not about that. Um, when we brought on Charlotte Kaslick, she's amazing because she's so proud of her physique. She's got an incredible sporting athletic body. And that's what we want Trady to be. We want it to be empowering for women. So we're very careful of who we pick. And then Kelly Cartwright is the cream on top. She's the most amazing woman I've ever met. Um, she chose to have it. Well, she had to have her leg amputated, but she did choose to have it amputated at 15, which is an amazing, incredible thing for a 15-year-old girl to have to do. Uh, and then from that point on, she went about creating a, an amazing identity and going to the Olympics, winning the gold medal in the 100-meter sprints. And now she does presentations and, and she's gone to the Olympics again, again, powerlifting. Like, people should follow Kelly Cartwright. She's an inspiration. And I signed her up because she posted a photo of herself in Trady Undies on Instagram and tagged us. I saw that. I looked into who she was, and I was like, this this girl's amazing. So I contacted her on Instagram as well, and she said, yep, let's do it, and away we went, and she came on board. So we're looking forward to doing some underwear ads with her in the near future, and um, and we certainly will. Interesting, interesting. So, okay, it's becoming pretty clear how this beautiful brand, Trady, has become such a household name. Uh, any Anything else, Ben, that you kind of put your finger on that's really allowed that to happen in such short a time? Oh, look, it's just having a crack. I think it's the Australian way. Once you get something that shows a bit of um, <clears throat> a bit of life, absolutely go for it. Throw every, the kitchen sink in it. I think that's the key. And I think we've been sensible of who we brought on. I think we've brought on people, um, characters that people really relate to. And as I keep coming back to, it's the beer test. If you go up to Danielle Scott at the pub and say, do you want to grab a beer in a nice way, she'll absolutely have a drink with you. Same with Nick. They're all wonderful mm-hmm. people and good fun. Whereas I think Australians see through these brat ambassadors and i think that's what we've done well we've picked um really really good personalities to represent the brand that i love yeah very true we see through brad ambassadors ain't that the truth and i i must say i mean there'd be a lot of listeners uh, business owners listening right now going well we can't afford ambassadors um it's an interesting strategy because inherently it feels expensive um i'd like yep. your comment on that um suffice to say i interviewed matthew pavlich about four or five weeks ago uh, ex-AFL legend for those who don't know who the PAV is he's now gone and started a business called Pickstar and it does allow you to access 
known sporting identities from everything from having them to your kids barbecue you know 10 year old birthday party uh an appearance there through to you know appearing in your marketing campaigns and it's a it's actually a technology company that allows you to go online and approach these guys who you'd love to have represent your brand so what's your view which is a fantastic it is idea. A, it is a, oh, it oh. is a fantastic idea what what's your view on is it an expensive strategy is it for everyone this whole endorsement uh, by celebrities uh, look, it's an interesting one. I the reason, I chose people that weren't well known. So the Honey Badger, as much as he's one of the most famous Australians now, when I approached him, he wasn't well known at all. And so I was able to do a much more affordable deal at the start. Um, we're now on a much more lucrative deal for him now because it's, it's only fair that he gets rewarded for the growth that we've had. Um, and the and the girls, we did good deals at the start, and again, then some of the Danny's have been renewed. So. I started with lesser known people, but with greater personalities, right? So that it wasn't that they were necessarily the best at what they did. I was looking for someone that had credibility, but also had the personality. Because, and then I also went direct with Instagram, right? Yeah. <laughs> or however I could contact them through LinkedIn, whatever it might be. Because the minute you get managers involved, oh. they just triple the cost, yeah. right? And it just becomes unbearable. And plus, a lot of the stars then don't hear about it. So even now, if I contact a manager about an AFL player, even for me, uh, now where we're at, it just becomes too expensive. Whereas I know if that player hears from me first saying, hey, I'm going to put you on tradie underwear ads and, and put it around the country, that player probably wants to do it. And he'll probably do it at a cheaper Absolutely. price because it's going to be a lot of fun. But the managers aren't telling them about it, I think. And they're throwing prices on them that just don't warrant it. And so p- businesses like us walk away. So that's why I was very tactful in working with the people that I have that understood that we're a small business trying to have a crack and then down the track, you know, they've been able to get more money along the line. Well, you hit the nail on the head. That's why Matthew talking about Pixstar was loving it. I mean, one of his challenges was to get past the managers and now he sort of somehow negotiated that. So when you go and approach a celebrity, a sporting star through Pixstar, they are directly getting a text saying, hey, someone's looking, there's a brief on Pixstar for this. Someone, you know, are you interested yep. in it? Here's the budget, here's the dates. And often, I think what we forget you know, we put these celebrities uh, up on pedestals and think, oh, they'd never have any time. They're so busy. Not necessarily true. And they do. They, no. they Yeah, there's a money factor and they want to earn a quid from their celebrity, but they also like getting out there and getting involved in the community and seeing what difference they can make and just enjoying that aspect of it. So I think the, le- the lesson there is just ask. Get on their Instagram and ask. Absolutely. Don't be afraid to, to be shot down. That's fine. And nothing lost. Correct. Right? Um But I think a lot of these players, I think the top 5% of players are the ones that are getting the deals, and so they're difficult to deal with. So what you've got to look for is the ones that are that are lesser known but have the quirks or whatever suits your brand um, and go for them. But, yeah, try and bypass the managers so that you can do it in a way that's effective for both. You know, it's clear that what's worked with us is that my people are, that I've signed up have gone ahead and, and actually taken on more sponsorships as a result with working with an underwear brand like us. So sometimes they've just got to see the big picture. Um, I think managers don't always see the big picture Correct. like that. They just want the immediate, immediate dollars. dollars. But, certainly been lucrative for uh, for my team long term the ones I've signed up Ben it's a great story just to finish up Scope give us a size sure. of the tradie brand now it excuse uh, annual turnover uh, it, whatever you can do to kind of give us a sense of, of scale yeah so I think we're um, I couldn't tell you excuse I, I actually don't know I get asked that a little bit but in terms of um, at retail we're about 80, 90 mil and we're, we're going to crack the 100 next year per, this is per annum so we're going to be very excited and throw a big party when we smash 100 mil per annum. Mm-hmm. But we are we are growing. So I, that's not the end of it. We're going to keep coming and we're going to keep spending on TV. I love it, mate. It's such a good story. It's so wonderful to hear something you've started from scratch with your old man with great intention and really clear purpose, by the way. You knew what you wanted to do. You set out with a, a vision clear in your sights and you've just chased it down. I think maybe we, we, we should have recognized that earlier because, again, having that purpose uh, and intention plays a big part in knowing where you want to get to. Um, I, I'm not sure just whether you know that as you speak about your underwear brand, just how many times, Ben, you say the word crack. <laughs> Yes, that's interesting. Yeah, obviously, uh, I'm just trying to cover up everyone's cracks. With my <laughs> Correct. Um, Correct. Yeah, I should have thought of that. I'll have, to, I'll have to take note and try and avoid that next time. Uh, ben, you're having a crack, buddy. Well yeah. done. For those who want to check it out, Trady with an I-E, T-R-A-D-I-E dot com is where that you can find out all about it. Ben Goodfellow, thank you for taking us behind the scenes of a wonderful, iconic Australian brand. Much appreciated. Thanks for taking the time. Well, there you go, team. 
Tradies underwear founder, branding guru, all-round good bloke, Ben Goodfellow. He certainly lives up to his name. And Ben, by the way, has kindly given me $2,100 vouchers to use over at tradie.com, which I'll be awarding to lucky listeners in upcoming Monster Prize Draw segments. So be sure to get your emails into me. Tell me what marketing's working for you. And um, if I read it on air, you get a prize or five or six. Now, here's what grabbed my attention from that chat with Ben, thanks to American Express. Attention grabber number one. I love Ben's passionate definition of a brand being a tribal attachment, you know, where you create something so powerful in the minds of your customers that they want to go to the pub and talk about your brand. That's what we're talking about, tribal attachment. Attention grabber number two, I love how Ben treats every one of his products as a billboard and makes the most of its impact on shelf. Very clever. From day one. Attention grabber number three, I think it was an absolutely genius move to have a whole lot of buses branded with tradies posters passing by Big W's HQ on a daily basis. What a great way to get the buyers that Ben wanted to appeal to to see Ben's new brand. That's what grabbed my attention. Love to know what grabbed yours. And you can also view the Honey Badger TV ad that launched the tradies brand over at Small Business Big Marketing dot com forward slash four five five well team that almost wraps up another episode of the award-winning small business big marketing show thanks to american express be sure to search amex business to find out how your business expenses can reward you and a big thanks to the guys at amex who are an absolute joy to work with for supporting the wow segment that i put together with steve sims each week Got some solid interviews coming up, including a chat with a fellow who used to be a rock star DJ, like he's in the top 100 DJs uh, in the world in the 90s, had a breakdown, came back from the breakdown, started a fish and chip shop franchise type thing, made a lot of money, and now he is teaching mindfulness and meditation to people like you and I. We even do a little meditation during the episode. So be excited or actually be relaxed, be very relaxed. Don't forget there's an entire back catalogue of interviews over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. If you love the show, and why wouldn't you? Hey, 455 episodes later, got to be doing something right. Let another business owner know about it by grabbing their phone, opening the podcast app, searching for Small Business Big Marketing, hit subscribe, hit play, hand it back to them. Until next week, I'm Timbo Reid. You're not. Thanks for tuning in. May your marketing be the best marketing. Bye for now.